Bob. Last time we were talking about polynomial representations of uh, GLM These are representations from GLM to some vector space. So, maybe I should write GLM k like this and this is some k vector space and the condition on these representations is that their matrix coefficients are all polynomials in the entries of this matrix. right? So, one way of thinking about it is to say that for every linear functional z on v and every vector v on v, uh, this function g goes to uh, the inner pro uh, well the pairing of z on rho g v is polynomial in v. The defining representation, for example, the representation of GLM k on k to the m is polynomial because its matrix entries are just the entries of the matrix. And then you can take tensor powers and you can take sub representations and quotient representations and so on. And what we found is that uh, such representations can be studied through Shure algebras. I had defined uh, algebras S, K, M, N. So, this M is just uh, the GLM M. This N is the homogeneous degree of the representation. The module, this is a Schur algebra and the module for the Schur algebra correspond to uh, homogeneous representations of degree N, homogeneous polynomial representations of degree N for this group. Every, th that just means that these matrix coefficients are actually homogeneous polynomials of degree n. And every uh, representation of G L M K which is polynomial breaks up into a sum of uh, representations which are homogeneous. So, in order to understand the polynomial representations of G L M K, for example, to classify the irreducible polynomial representations, it is enough to understand the modules for S K M N. Let me quickly remind you how S K M N was defined. S K M N was just defined as the dual vector space of something I called A K M N. And A K M N is just homogeneous polynomials in the entries of the matrix. So, that means in m squared variables of degree n. So, this is just uh, this is not an algebra, this is just a space it, and you look at its dual space and that can be made in, into an algebra. The notation I used was um, that, um, so given alpha and beta in this I want to tell you what alpha beta is. So, I must tell you what alpha beta does to a polynomial and the notation I used for that was this. Um, um, so, this just means the linear functional alpha beta what it does to the polynomial f. I use the notation of integral just uh, it is just a formal thing it does not really mean anything, but it is a nice intuitive notion because it allows you to think of elements of the Schur algebra as distributions as polynomial distributions on the group. So, I define the product. So, I must tell you what this is in terms of the action of alpha and the action of beta. And this becomes now g here is g l m k and this is just uh, by definition f of x y d alpha x d beta. And I had explained why this makes sense. This is a polynomial in x and y. Therefore, you can think of a, it as a polynomial in y whose coefficients are polynomials in x. You can integrate out those coefficients and you can get a polynomial in y 
that's the inner integral and then you integrate that out and you get a uh, element of k so that's the double integral so this is the definition of the product and so this is just the definition of the sure function a uh, sure algebra okay now let's come down to trying to actually understand what this algebra looks like specifically so the basic uh, combinatorial object here i'll call i m n it's nothing but uh, you take the set 1 to m and take its n fold cartesian power A K M N, yeah. Yes, yeah, so my thing was um, I did not want to introduce the notion of a coalgebra. Usually, the way it is done is that this is shown to be a coalgebra, and from that you get an algebra. There is no need to introduce a coalgebra. We are all familiar with the representation theory of modules, but yeah, exactly. So it's worth mentioning that in uh, Green's exposition, for example, uh, there is a coalgebra. But I would also mention that in Schur's PhD thesis, there is no coalgebra. There is just an algebra, and he just defines it using formal symbols, which is what I'm coming to in a moment. And he does everything. He doesn't even say algebra. He defines a bunch of operators and how the rules for their composition. So, this um, coalgebra thing is a rather uh, later thing which I feel is an unnecessary, uh, unnecessarily introducing a new concept. Okay, so, here is here's the combinatorial object that will uh, play a role in understanding the Schur algebra. I just take the set of numbers from 1 to m and take their n fold Cartesian power. This is just um, things of the form, I will write them as uh, i underscores, they are multi indices i 1 up to i n, where each of these things is from 1 to m. Yeah, so the dimension of S k m n is just the dimension of A k m n, it is a finite dimensional vector space. Yeah, I will, I will now I will describe precisely a basis for SKMN and uh, so that is this is called a multi index and um, given two multi indices you can write down a monomial in the n squared variables x i 1 j 1 x i 2 j 2 x i n j n. This is a monomial of degree n. I hope it is understood here is that j is the multi index j1, j2, jn. Okay. So, now this is a monomial of degree n, and um, you know you can make S n act on I m n. just by uh, w, so w is some permutation, it acts on i 1, i n, w is a permutation of n objects by acting on these indices, it just permutes these numbers, i w 1, i w n, that is the action. And I will say that, um, see these monomials are defined by pairs of multi indices. Um, so, I will say that two pairs of multi indices are equivalent, these are all multi indices. If there exists W in S n such that w dot i is equal to k and w dot 
j is equal to n. That means, you can find a permutation that takes i to k and the same permutation takes j to l. The relevance of this definition is that x i j and x k l represent the same monomial. See, I could have just rearranged these terms in the uh, monomial and it would still be the same monomial and this uh, definition of equivalence precisely captures that. So, x i j is x k l if and only if i j i comma j is equivalent to k comma l. That is why I have this definition. Okay. Now, define epsilon i j to be Okay, so it follows that the dimension of uh, the dimension of a k m n is the number of equivalence classes um, under this equivalence relation of pairs of multi indices because that gives you all the monomials exactly once, and the number of monomials is the number of such classes. Okay, okay. So then I'll try to give a basis of SKMN, the Schur algebra, and so I'll just try to take a dual. But of course, many of these are equivalent, so I'll just take care of that. So epsilon IJ, that's an element of the Schur algebra. By taking um, epsilon IJ XKL or maybe I should be writing integral x k l d epsilon i j x, right. These are just the same notation to be um, 1 if i j is equivalent to k l and 0 otherwise. And this is going to be a basis for uh, the Schur algebra as i comma j runs over uh, a set of representatives for the equivalence classes of pairs of multi indices. Let me just write that down. Epsilon subscript i j as i comma j runs over the S n orbits in I m n squared. That means, S n acts diagonally on I m n squared is a basis of S k m n. Now, we have got hold of a basis of the Schur algebra. Let us try to see what the structure constants are. In other words, if I take two such things and multiply them, what do I get? So, what I want to know is if I take epsilon i j times epsilon k l then I can certainly expand it as uh, C R S epsilon R S. I want to know what these co uh, structure constants C R S are. They of course, depend on I, J, K and L. But, and here I would take a sum over R S in S n mod I m n squared, right. That is that's the thing I want to calculate. Well, um, just a matter of unwinding definitions. So, uh, C R S is um, is what I will get if I evaluate this product on the monomial X R S, right. So, it is just integral over G X R S or maybe I will call it GRS. I, I want to use x and y later for the fact. But this is a matrix and this is uh, um, this is a mono, uh, this is the uh, 
uh, G is a matrix and this GRS denotes a monomial evaluated on that matrix. So, it is uh, the G R 1 S 1, G R 2 S 2, it is that product of entries of the matrix. So, think of it as a monomial function and so I want to calculate this D epsilon i j epsilon k l g and that is by definition the double integral of, now I must take x and y two matrices, multiply them and look at the R s, the monomial corresponding to R s, d epsilon i j x, d epsilon k l y. This is just the definition of multiplication. Now, this is easily seen to be just by the rule for multiplying matrices, summation over all uh, t in i m n, all multi indices t of x r t y t s. They are just asking that I take the product of two matrices and try to write down the monomial corresponding to the multi indices R and S. Okay, but the entries of that matrix themselves are given by a sum like this, where these are not multi indices, but just one single index. If you try to write down the monomial, you will get a sum like this over all multi indices, because it is just a product of the you know, corresponding monomials. And these things, uh, suppose we are just computing the inner integral, this is a constant as far as x is concerned and this thing will either be 0 or 1, it will be 0 if the uh, pair r comma t is equivalent to the pair i comma j, sorry it will be 1 if that is the case and it will be 0 if r comma t is not equivalent to i comma j. So, what you get is that this is equal to a purely combinatorial thing. C R S is equal to the number of T, oh, sorry, I want the number of T in I M N such that R T is equivalent to I J and T S is equivalent to K L. just this number. Okay, Let us just keep this aside for a moment and look at another structure where these numbers appear. Okay, so, these are the structure constants for the Schur algebra. When you multiply epsilon i j with epsilon k l, these are the coefficients of epsilon r s. Okay, now, I will just look at something slightly different and we will see that these same kinds of numbers appear. So, think of just this uh, vector space k m, the defining representation of g l m and I will write down a basis just consisting of the coordinate vectors e 1, e m. E i is the ith coordinate vector. Now, look at the n fold tensor product of this. This has basis, I will denote it by E underscore i, uh, where this i is a multi index and I will just define this to be E i 1 tensor, E i 2 tensor dot 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 E i n, where i is i 1, i 2, i n. And, uh, this has uh, this is a representation of uh, Sn. Just by uh, W as permutation, rho is what I'm calling this representation of um, E 
i is e w i. You just permute the order in which you take the tensor product. Now, suppose T is a linear map, linear endomorphism on this thing. I will use the notation, um, matrix notation. So, T now I have this basis E i where i runs over all uh, uh, multi indices for uh, this vector space. So, for uh, uh, linear endomorphisms, I would have matrices whose rows and columns are indexed by this matrix. So, the notation I will use is that T is T i j, where T i j is the i jth entry of this matrix corresponding to the multi indices i and j. This is just the matrix notation. And one easily checks that T commutes with the symmetric group action if and only if well okay by definition t of w dot e j is equal to w t e j for every multi index j. Okay, let us just calculate what this means in terms of the uh, matrices. Take the ith coordinate of this. So, T, maybe I will do it on a fresh board. T w e j, it is ith coordinate is summation T i w j, right, because w e j is e w j. Um, sorry, there is there is no summation here, it is just this. And that is how you get the matrix from a linear map with respect to a basis. On the other hand, if I look at W T E J i, so T E J will have um, um, W inverse ith coordinate. So, I should to, to find the ith um, to, to find the ith coordinate of W dot something, I should find the W inverse W inverse dot ith coordinate of this. Right, so this should be T E J W inverse dot i, but that is T W inverse dot i comma j. So what you get is that uh, T is an S M endomorphism. That is, it commutes with the action of S N if and only if. Um, these things are equal for all multi indices i, j and for all w in the symmetric group. So, I can just write that as um, T w i sorry w dot i w dot j equals T i j for all i, j in i, m, n, w in S n. This suggests a basis of um, this algebra define E 
i j this will be a linear map. So, I will tell you what it is um, k lth coordinate is. So, it is 1 if i j is equivalent to k l and 0 otherwise. This forms a basis for the algebra of uh, such matrices and um, it is not difficult after all this to just check that if you take epsilon i j and map it to E i j. This was the basis element of the Schur algebra, this is the basis element of the endomorphism algebra of the n fold tensor product of k to the m. This is an isomorphism of algebras. And this fact is completely, oops, okay, let me get my m and n right. This fact is completely unconditional on the relationship between m and n. So, what we have done now is we have expressed the Schur algebra as an endomorphism of some representation of the symmetric group. And now, we will exploit a general theorem about this kind of situation. I will just state it without proof, it is not very difficult to see. Um, suppose, I have some um, completely reducible A module rho tilde comma V. A is just some algebra completely reducible um, A module. I will be applying this theorem to the case where A is the group ring of the symmetric group and uh, this is uh, k to the, the n fold tensor power of k to the m. Now, if uh, n is uh, uh, yeah, so if n is uh, larger than the characteristic of k, then this a module will be uh, split semi-simple, and uh, whatever I say in this theorem will uh, kick in. Let b be uh, the endomorphism algebra. So, this is just going to be the Schur algebra in our situation. Then, B is semi simple. It will just be a sum of matrix algebras, that is why it is semi simple the complete reducibility ensures that. And uh, if I somehow make a list of the simple uh, A modules which occur here, so I will index them by some lambda, rho lambda v lambda is um, the set of isomorphism classes of simple a modules occurring in um, root tilde v, then for every lambda there exists sigma tilde lambda w lambda, a simple b module such that um, 
V breaks up into a direct sum over lambda W lambda tensor V lambda. You should think of this as a decomposition of modules for the algebra A tensor B. What is more is that sigma lambda w lambda as lambda runs over whatever set we are using to index the v lambda is a complete set of representatives of isomorphism classes of simple representations, simple B modules. Just by knowing the simple A modules which occur in V, you can classify all the simple B modules. And our situation is exactly you know what we need for applying this. Therefore, the first thing we need to do is to figure out what are the simple representations of the symmetric group which occur in this uh, Km tensor power n. And now, I will assume that the characteristic of k is um, strictly greater than n, so that I am assured that uh, k m tensor n is completely reducible. So, before we do that, let me just uh, make one observation. Suppose, I is um, I 1 i n is a multi index. These are the things that index the basis of k m tensor n. Um, Let us define a subset S k to be those j uh, in 1 to m such that um, the jth sorry, uh, those j in 1 to n such that the jth, uh, jth index in the multi index is equal to k. Okay, so, I will just uh, pick those subscripts for which i j is equal to k then um, this will give a partition of uh, 1 to n. So, I am just taking the subscripts and partitioning them according to what the value of i k is. Okay, so, all the ones for which i k is 1 that will be in the first set, all the ones for which i k is 2 that will be in the second set, all the ones for which i k is 3 that will be in the third set and so on. That is clearly a partition of 1 to n, right? because everything has to go into some set. Some of these parts could be empty that I am not too worried about, but what I get is 1 to n is a set partition, partition S 1 disjoint union S m. Some of these things could be empty and let lambda j be the cardinality of S j. Then what is the stabilizer? in S n of i. Well, it is just a product of um, the stabilizers of these sets, the symmetric, the symmetric groups of these subsets. So, it is um, you know S lambda 1 cross S lambda 2 cross S lambda m. It is a product of symmetric groups. And, uh, you know, if you rearrange these uh, lambda 1 to lambda m in decreasing order, then this subgroup, these prod factors get uh, permuted, it is just amounts to a conjugation in the big symmetric group S n. Okay, so, this um, this uh, what this says is that if you take the orbit of E subscript i, then, um, so let us just call that span of um, E 
i prime where i prime belongs to s n dot i. This is an invariant subspace of this um, n fold tensor product of k to the m, but this subspace is isomorphic to um, a very familiar representation when we are doing the representation of the theory of symmetric group. This is called a Young subgroup and it is a representation induced from the trivial representation of the Young subgroup or in uh, more without talk about induced representations. It is um, the permutation representation on the set x lambda, where x lambda is um, the set of all subsets S 1 S M ordered M tuples such that cardinality of S i is equal to lambda i and they are disjoint and their union is 1 to n. If this is a set on which the symmetric group acts, then if you take um, k valued functions on this set or just take a basis indexed by these sets that becomes a representation of the symmetric group. And what we are saying is that this index multi index i it will generate a subgroup isomor a sub representation of k to the m tensor power n that is isomorphic to this thing. And for this thing from the representation theory of symmetric groups we have Young's rule which tells us how to decompose this right. So, we get k x lambda is equal to direct sum mu less than or equal to lambda v mu and its multiplicity is a Koska number k mu lambda. I would not go into what this k mu lambda is, suffices to say that it is a positive, but let me just remind you what mu less than or equal to lambda means. Mu less than or equal to lambda means that uh, mu 1 plus dot 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 plus mu i is greater than or equal to lambda 1 plus dot 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 lambda i for all i greater than or equal to 1. So, this is called the reverse dominance uh, partial order on partitions. Now, there is only one uh, restriction on this lambda, um, this lambda you see this m, um, this partition lambda where was it coming from? I had this uh, multi index i and I used it to partition the set 1 to n into m parts and then I rearranged those in decreasing order. So, this thing had exactly m parts, when I rearrange them the parts which are 0 come at the end. If I think of it as a partition, it is going to be a partition with at most m parts. So, the restriction on this is that um, all these lambdas will have uh, at most m parts. So, we know that uh, lambda 1 prime is less than or equal to m, but if mu is less than or equal to lambda, this is uh, well known to be, right, you know we have seen this before, uh, mu prime is greater than or equal to lambda prime, which implies that just taking this rule for i equals 1, that mu 1, mu prime 1 is less than or equal to lambda prime 1, which is less than or equal to m. So, the conclusion is that um, the irreducible representations of S n, which occur in k to the m n fold tensor power are the v lambdas for which uh, lambda has at most m parts and all those do occur, because in here the one piece uh, v lambda, where the multiplicity is 1. Let me just write that down because it is the conclusion of all this discussion.
simple representations of S n occurring in the n fold tensor power of k to the m are the ones rho lambda v lambda where lambda is a partition of n with lambda having not more than m parts which is the same as saying that the conjugate partition has first part less than or equal to m. That is the, so now we are ready to apply this theorem which I had stated a little earlier because now we know what these things are and so we know that uh, at least we get uh, classification of the simple modules for the Schur algebra. Okay, we will try to do a little better, we will try to get some understanding of what they are and um, this is also work that goes back to Schur. Um, for finite groups, representation of finite groups, you have seen that their characters, uh, you know, at least in the semi simple case, determine the group, uh, the representation up to isomorphism. It, if two representations have the same character, then they are isomorphic. As something similar holds for polynomial representations of um, GLM. But here we can bring into play the beautiful theory of symmetric functions. Suppose sigma w is a polynomial representation of G L M. Okay. Then I will define its, I will call it characteristic. That is a polynomial in variables x1 to xm and it is just defined to be the trace of um, sigma x1 xm. Just take the diagonal matrix with diagonal entries x1 xm and look at its trace in the vector space w. Okay, but uh, you know if you were to interchange two of these that would amount to conjugating this matrix by a permutation matrix and what that would mean is that uh, sigma of the permuted thing would be conjugate to um, sigma of the original thing and you would get the same trace and so this is actually a symmetric polynomial in x1, x2, xm. Why is it polynomial? Well, it is polynomial just because sigma w is a polynomial representation. These entries are polynomials. Uh, sorry, I mean if you take any basis of w, then the entries of sigma x1, x2, xm are polynomials in x1, x2, xm. You are adding up certain entries. It is a symmetric polynomial in these things. And our goal is to firstly to calculate these things for the representations w lambda and secondly to show that they determine representations up to um, isomorphism just like for finite groups. Under the hypothesis that um, the characteristic of k is greater than n, the case where that theorem applied. Okay. Now to begin with uh, let me just prove a little lemma. Let us calculate the characteristic of uh, the representation k to the m tensor power n. Actually, um, so firstly assume that um, okay, I will just define some notation let p w lambda be the trace of um, w, this is a representation of S n. So, w is in S n on 
this k x lambda. Since this is a permutation representation, this is just the number of fixed points in x lambda under the action of w, the number of w fixed points in x lambda. Okay, and then the lemma is Okay, just for clarity, uh, since there are going to be now two groups acting, there is going to be the symmetric group and there is going to be the matrix group. Um, on uh, k m tensor n, I will look at two representations. Um, one is uh, that of the symmetric group, which I just explained to you by permuting the um, you know in the tensor power you permute the tensor factors and I will call that um, let me call that rho and um, and for g l m k. Well, this acts by Kronecker tensors on this I mean g l m k acts on k so it acts on uh, k m so it acts on the tensor power I will call that sigma. And here is a lemma which is quite interesting to prove. Uh, the trace of uh, these two actions commute because I just showed that um, the Schur algebra is the endomorphism algebra of this representation of S n. And from that, it is not difficult to show that this action commutes because the action of the Schur algebra is built from the action of GLMK. Okay, or rather, you can recover the action of GLMK from the action of the Schur algebra. I described how to do this in the last lecture, and that process will show that these things commute. So, I can come write in any order I like, I can either write rho w and then sigma x1. Yeah, so you are saying it is actually quite trivial, yeah. Here I am just coming back to, yeah. That is true, it is quite clear that they commute here. And the trace of this, the character of this, I can write either rho, rho w first or I can write sigma x1, x2, xm first, does not matter, but this on, let us calculate this thing, km tensor n. And the answer is that this will be summation p w lambda m lambda x 1 x m, where m lambda is the monomial symmetric function of shape lambda. This is the um, sum of all monomials in x1, x2, xm uh, of shape lambda. A monomial is of shape lambda if one of the variables occurs with power lambda 1, another occurs with power lambda 2, another occurs with power lambda 3 and so on. If you take all the monomials of that shape, you get a symmetric function and it is that. And this is a sum over uh, all lambda, I guess. Mm. And um, you know, when I look at monomial functions um, in m variables, monomial symmetric functions, they are 0 except when, uh, they are 0 if the number of parts of lambda is greater than m. So, here I might as well assume that I am looking at partitions with at most m parts. This is the monomial symmetric function of shape lambda. And well, how do you compute the trace of something? Just the easiest way is to take a basis and then look at what each basis vector contributes. We already have a basis. We will take E i, where i is a multi index. And let us look at what happens when we do rho w sigma x1 xm to this. So, 
So, what will happen is that when you do this, then you will get x 1 to the i 1, x 2 to the i 2 and so on. So, I will write that as x to the i, that is just x 1 to the power i 1, x 2 to the power i 2 and so on and um, times E w dot i, because this thing just permutes the uh, multi index down there. So, the contribution to the trace will be 0 if w dot i is not equal to i and if w dot i is equal to i, the contribution to the trace will be x to the i. So, um, the, the trace itself will be, um, so i contributes to the trace if and only if w dot i is equal to i, which means that um, the partition, um, you know, so to i you can associate this partition S1, S2, Sm. It just means that this partition is preserved, the parts of this partition are preserved um, by w. So, so, that means if and only if um, S1, S2, Sn, this is of course in x lambda, but I want to say that it is fixed by w. And the, well, this is in x lambda for some lambda, but if it is in x lambda, then the contribution is to uh, the monomial symmetric function x to the lambda, m lambda. Com so, it contributes m lambda to the trace if and only if uh, w i is i and the corresponding uh, well, maybe I can just erase this, if and only if S1, S2, Sn is in x lambda w. So, this gives a bijection between the basis elements which contribute m lambda to the trace and uh, which contribute a monomial of shape lambda to the trace and uh, the fixed points of this thing. Okay, so, that shows that uh, the trace is just the coefficient of m lambda is this. Okay, so that is uh, one calculation and now let us, we will just uh, use some uh, fact from uh, symmetric functions, which I would not prove today. It has to do with uh, various transition matrices between different families of symmetric functions and it says the following. It says that now, here we are looking at symmetric functions in m variables. There is this notion of symmetric functions in very large number of variables or ideally in infinitely many variables. I will not go into all that, but I will just, um, those can be specialized to n variables and the result is the following. If you take the sum over all partitions of n, S lambda, this is a sure function of shape lambda. And this is where sure functions will come in through this identity. What is chi lambda w? Um, chi lambda is the character of uh, rho lambda or v lambda, the representation of S n corresponding to lambda, the partition lambda at the permutation w. This is equal to the sum over um, P w lambda, m lambda, x 1, x m. So, this is uh, again the same expression here. We had proved this uh, in one of my earlier lectures on symmetric functions. Um, I would not do the proof again. Okay, so, this is the fact this is the only fact that we will use from the theory of symmetric functions. On the other hand, we have this decomposition, um, you know, 
let me write it down here. Yeah. So what I'm going to say is that we have this decomposition of um, k m tensor power n as summation of well I should write it as direct sum uh, lambda prime 1 less than or equal to m of w lambda tensor v lambda. So, if you take the character, uh, so we calculated the character of the left hand side. What is the character of the right hand side? The character of the right hand side is um, summation, this guy has character summation chi lambda x 1 x m. chi lambda w. So, what we get is that uh, this, this guy, we calculated though that to be this thing. So, this guy is equal to summation of the characteristic of the lambda -th representation. and I can just forget about this bit. So, just the intermediate step. So, these two things are equal. Where are they equal? Um, you should think of these, this as an identity in um, the group ring of the symmetric group, but not with coefficients in k, but with coefficients in symmetric, po symmetric polynomials. So, let us use uh, lambda k m to denote um, symmetric polynomials in m variables with coefficients in k and just take the group ring of the symmetric group with these coefficients. So, both these are expressions in that, this is an element of the symmetric group and these things are symmetric polynomials in m variables, right. So, these two things are equal in this ring. Now, uh, in this um, ring, well, just think of it as a vector space, the um, characters of the symmetric group are linearly independent elements. Therefore, if two linear combinations of those things are equal, then their coefficients must be equal, okay. And here we have got, in fact, lambda 1 prime less than or equal to m as an additional uh, thing, because we know that other things do not occur here. Okay, so, what does that get us? It gives us a couple of things. Firstly, it gives us uh, the characteristic of W lambda. Which is one of the major theorems. It also gives us a somewhat innocuous fact that if lambda 1 prime, if lambda has more than m parts, then the corresponding Schur function must be 0 uh, when specialized to m variables. Lambda prime 1 is greater than m. You could have proved this using other means, but this is a nice proof of it. Okay. And uh, this I will need in order to uh, conclude that a polynomial representation is determined by its characteristic. See, what is going on here is, we have got these uh, symmetric functions in infinitely many variables. I will call them wedge k lambda k and I will use n to denote the degree and homogeneous part and then you have got specialization, which means that you, you keep only m variables and the rest you set to be 0. So, then you get a symmetric function in finitely many variables x 1 up to x m. And um, what we have is that here s lambda lambda is a partition of n, that this thing is a basis. 
right. So, its image here must be a must be a generating set. So, this is a basis implies that S lambda where lambda has less than or equal to m parts is a spanning set. But then it is not difficult to see for example, using monomial symmetric functions that the dimension of this space is precisely the number of partitions with at most m parts. So, this spanning set must be a basis. Okay, I, I was able to write this here because of this fact that the others just go to 0. So, the non-zero ones must be a spanning set. So, what I get is that the Schur functions um, s lambda, well strictly speaking I should write s lambda x 1, x 2, x m, where lambda has at most m parts form a basis of symmetric functions of degree n um, in m variables. So, then from that I can conclude that um, these things are uh, linearly independent and from that I can conclude that if two uh, representations have the same um, characteristic, then they must be isomorphic because these things being linearly independent, uh, the, their, the multiplicities are just the coefficients in their character in terms of these things and they are completely determined. So, get one more theorem of sure that sigma w and tau mu tau u if sigma w and tau u are polynomial representations of gl m with characteristic sigma equals characteristic tau then they are isomorphic.